Greetings, my fellow Denzians of the 41st millennium, and welcome to the channel. My name is Adeptus Artorum, and on this channel, we aim to bring you guys stories, lore, facts, and all-around information from the vast expanse of the Warhammer 40,000 universe. In today's video, we will be discussing a topic very close to my heart, the Lord of Plagues, Chaos God of Disease and Decay, Grandfather Nurgle. And as a devoted Death Guard player myself, I am truly excited to be discussing this topic with you guys on the channel today. Now in this video, I will not by any means be discussing literally everything there is to know about Nurgle, but we will aim to cover a vast amount of information pertaining to the Lord of Plagues, and as always, I intend to leave you with at least a very basic overview to help your understanding of just who or what Nurgle is. I also aim to make this an ongoing series discussing each of the Chaos Gods, their specific pantheons and origins, and, well, much, much more. So, without any further ado, let's get into this video. Now, Nurgle, as stated before, is the Chaos God of Plagues, Disease, Decay, and some would argue death. But I just thought that I would throw an opinion out here before we get into the facts, as it's easy to label things as just a specific thing. But as with most things in 40k, I don't believe it's as cut and dry as that usually. So yes, of course, Nurgle is in fact the Chaos God of Plagues, Disease and Decay, but he is also the God of Life, and allow me to explain what I mean here. So Nurgle is, as stated previously, of course, without doubt the Great Lord of Decay, Plague and Pestilence, and of course, as a human being, you don't want to catch diseases. The idea of getting some horrific disease that causes disgusting buboes and rotting flesh and other various ailments, the pain and the suffering that accompanies them, mm, it's just not exactly an attractive thought, is it? Yeah, in this equation, we have to be aware of one key factor, that being the fact that everything within the material universe no matter how well made, long living, invincible or permanent they may seem, the fact is that at some stage they will become liable to eventual corruption, rot or decay, whether that be down to disease, decay in general, destruction at the hands of others or of course the one that none of us escape eventually, the passing of time. Now, essentially all Nurgle does is aid in sowing the seeds of entropy, using his various strains of infections and epidemics. Now, despite us looking at Nurgle with human eyes, of course we cannot help doing so, essentially seeing the work that he does as vile and horrific, Nurgle himself does not see it this way, and it is not, in fact, a morbid being. Now, the point I'm getting at here is essentially life inevitably brings death, and death similarly produces new life. This is simply a fact of life as the work of decomposition done by either scavengers, various invertebrates, and microbes, essentially completing the life cycle, consuming and making use of the many nutrients locked in dead plants, animals, and of course human beings. So, when you think about it in this sense, death is essentially what makes life possible. Now, I'm sure we will go over concepts like this multiple times within the course of this video, but this is just something that I have seen breed discussion in the past, and it is something that makes a lot of sense to me personally. And for all you guys who are regular viewers of our channel, you know that we love to have discussions in the comments. So, without further ado now, let's get into some facts about Nurgle, the being himself. So, Nurgle was the third of the beings labelled as Chaos Gods to awake within the Immaterium. The first being Khorne, the Blood God, and the second being Zinch, the God of Change, with Nurgle following shortly after. Now, it's important to mention that each Chaos God embodies a particular aspect of mortal existence, those being Wrath for Khorne, Change for Zinch, Pleasure for Slanesh, and of course Death and Decay for Nurgle, though this is putting it in extremely basic terms for all of them, essentially. 
Now, with this being taken into account, you can begin to essentially understand how exactly it is that these beings came into existence. But in order to help you better understand, I'll give you a brief explanation anyway. So, chaos entities derive their power psychically from the various emotions and mental power of living creatures within the materium, that being real space, the known universe. And so, as some may assume, they have not, in fact, existed since the dawn of time, essentially only coming into existence after there was, well, enough life within the materium to essentially jumpstart the process of their creation. Now, as life evolved, more species of course came into being and spread, their emotions and respective mental power spreading and evolving with them, and so the power of these warp-born entities grew exponentially, being consequently fed by the evolving life forms of the materium. Now, <clears throat> as stated before, Nurgle was the third of these benevolent warp beings to awaken, coming into existence during the second millennium in the period of Old Earth's history dubbed the Middle Ages. As you can imagine, during this time, periods of vast plagues, illnesses and disease swept the lands of then Europe and other areas of the Earth, effectively giving birth to the being we now know as Nurgle. Now, Nurgle is known by many titles pertaining to his status as the Lord of Plague and Disease. A few of these said titles being the Plague Lord, the Plague God, Plague Father, the Lord of Decay, the Lord of Pestilence, the Great Corrupter, Grandfather Nurgle, the Master of Plague and Pestilence, and my absolute favourite of his many titles, the Fly Lord. I also want to mention that he does of course get called Papa Nurgle also. Now, many of these varying cults, followers and worshippers of Nurgle may also refer to him in other ways, but these mantles are just an example of the few most prevalent within his respective pantheon's worshippers. Now, Nurgle, as we have by now concluded, is the Chaos God most immediately involved in the plight of mortal beings with that being more often than not those human beings who suffer from an unshakable fear of death, a symptom that I think that we can all argue is probably one of the most prevalent fears of humanity as a whole. This being of course due to the uncertainty of essentially what happens next, if anything at all. I also feel it's important to state that though it is a large fear within the ranks of humanity, other races of the 41st millennium are not exempt from this fear. In fact, a grand majority of other races within the known universe suffer from this exact same fear. And as you can imagine, this also feeds Nurgle's power and effectively brings those with said fear slowly but surely into Nurgle's embrace his whispers of salvation from this grim fate echoing in the ears of most, if not all, that bear it. Now, as I previously stated, while Nurgle is in fact the god of both death and decay, he is also arguably the god of rebirth, and of course decay and the inevitable death that eventually accompanies it is simply put just one part of the ongoing cycle of life without which, as I explained earlier, no new life could blossom and grow. Now, in this same way of thinking, it can also be stated that Nurgle is in fact also the god of preservance and survival. As while those who wish to sow Nurgle's oats effectively spreading corruption, decay and disease are certainly numbered amongst the being's followers, there are also many whom turn to his worship from a desire to endure, using his granted boons to become resilient enough to handle the challenges, difficulties and in turn the opportunities presented by the grim, dark and uncaring universe of the 41st millennium. In essence, many of those within the ranks of Nurgle's worshippers usually turn to the god happily, accepting his various diseases and poxes in order to escape the pain and sheer despair caused by sickness and disease within the 41st millennium. Especially within the ranks of humanity, disease and plague is utterly rife, and so as you can imagine, there is never a shortage of new followers looking to escape the pain of disease 
and the absolute certainty of a grim and painful, slow, rotting death. In conclusion, to state what has been said by many others regarding this subject, though Nurgle is the great lord of decay and the master of plague and pestilence, all things, no matter how long lived and permanent they may seem, are without doubt liable to the eventual corruptions of the universe, whether by natural means or of course the hand of someone or something else, which then inevitably leads to the slumber of death. Even the very process of creation is nothing but the precursor to destruction and the eventual inevitable decay that follows all things. And to quote what has been said many times before once again, the bastion of today is tomorrow's ruin, the maiden of the morning is the crone of the night, and the hope of moment is but the foundation of regret. Now, though all of this seems very grim, Nurgle being the creator of essentially every known infection, epidemic and plague to ever take root within the known universe, Nurgle is not actually a grim and depressing purveyor of dreary despair, in fact completely the opposite. He is in fact a jolly and well-spirited god of life and laughter, as stated before in the inevitability of death, there is of course life which forms upon the decay of living things as an absolutely unfathomable number of bacteria, viruses, insects and other carrion feeding beings feed and thrive. The true nature of life is that life feeds upon other life to exist and just as with the evolution of sentient life forms, from every plague grows new generations stronger and more virulent than the others that came previously. And so, as this has been stated many times before, regeneration comes from decay, just as hope springs from despair. The greatest inspiration comes in the darkest moments. In times of crisis, mortals are truly tested and driven to become all they can be. Now I understand that Nurgle is, as a being may seem rather contradictory, yet to fully understand what seems utterly contradictory in nature, you must first begin to understand what exactly it is that Nurgle actually embodies. On the one hand, as we have been discussing, he is of course this figure of disease and decay and illness, covered in his entirety in essentially every known pox and plague known to man, but then, on the other hand, is also this god that is full of completely unanticipated energy and drive with a desire to essentially enlighten and organise his followers and plagues, etc. So, yeah, you know, I, I can see how it can be, of course, very confusing, as we all probably can. It's quite contradictory. But... All humanity, with absolutely none being exempt, know very well that one day their lives will inevitably end and that the vast majority of them will have to suffer either the pain of disease, injury or mental anguish and depression that will eventually aid or lead to this eventual inevitable fate. Yet this knowledge is seemed to be buried deep into the back of each human's mind as they then effectively try to forget about such things, distracting themselves with endless, you know, dreams and constant activity, you know, like a uh, hobbying. Nurgle is the embodiment of that knowledge humanity places at the back of its mind, and that unconscious fear and subsequent response within all sentient beings pertaining to the knowledge of their own impending and inevitable doom, is essentially this subconscious fear of disease, illness and death, and the tormenting truth of mortality, and the subsequent defiance of the, or you know, the uh, will to live that it breeds, that essentially generates an essential part of Nurgle's power, granting people this wish for a release from death, effectively luring them in to his worship. Now, it's worth stating that not all people who spread Nurgle's gifts are devout worshippers of the god, or in fact even worshippers at all. In fact, literally every single human in the known galaxy has been touched by Nurgle's hand at some stage within their lives. 
A countless number of human beings are host to his malignant unseen designs, which slowly corrupt their physical being while simultaneously sowing despair and dejection in their minds. All this occurs as more and more humans visit and migrate to new and, and you know, out of the way planets, effectively carrying Nurgles, many poxes and illnesses with them, and so they spread and they spread and they spread, becoming more and more virulent with every newcomer to a world or colony, no matter how far or close to other worlds or colonies it may be. Now, as Nurgle's gifts multiply and become more and more prevalent, the transform into full-blown pandemics, spreading Nurgle's gift to entire civilizations, and in turn his power reaches its heights and entire systems at times, even entire sectors, must be quarantined as his plagues and infections run rife across the galaxy. Once proud civilizations crumble under these pandemics and effectively wither away as Grandfather Nurgle conjures an untold number of vile new life forms from their rotting remains. And as has been stated before, wherever there are plague pits and mass graves, the rotting splendor of Nurgle shines through. Now, I want to make it abundantly clear, as I said before, that not everybody carrying some form of disease is some devout worshipper of the plague god. In fact, only a truly devoted few actually embrace Nurgle's greatness profoundly within the ranks of both humans and Xenos. Yet, these true believers are not numbered in the absolute trillions. The Grandfather's worshippers have at least enough to ensure that the many demons that serve him are able to bleed through into the material dimension absolutely anywhere that plague becomes rife. And this suits Nurgle just fine, as within the ranks of the Chaos Gods, Nurgle is the Chaos God that most appreciates a personal touch. Now, most Chaos Gods have both colours and a sacred number pertaining to their worship. Khorne, the Blood Gods being eight, Zinch, the God of Changes being nine, the God of Pleasure, Slaanesh's being six, and lastly, Nurgle's sacred number being seven, which is strange because that's my lucky number. <laughs> now, I also thought it worth a mention that there is also a debate by fans of the 40k universe as to whether Nurgle actually has two sacred numbers, the second being three. And I've in fact seen some pretty convincing arguments on this case. For an example, Nurgle's symbolism and iconography usually depicts a tripartid icon with three circles and three points, or a fly with two wings and a head. There are also a varied other amount of things that people could essentially tie to why Nurgle seems to like the number three. For example, one I see come up in like debate quite frequently is the number three representing the cycle of life, you know, that being life to death to fecundity. And now, with the before stated, I will say that there is actually not truly enough evidence in both literature nor other law content to 100% confirm Nurgle's love for the number three. But I thought that I would mention it, as like I always say, it's something largely discussed by 40k fans pertaining to Nurgle, and as we commonly say on this channel, we're all about breeding discussion. So, moving on quickly to the colours associated with Nurgle and displayed by his followers, as you can imagine, they are usually that of shades of browns mixed with oranges, resembling that of rust and vomit and decay, greens and pustulant yellows resembling that of rot, mucus and pus, or essentially any other colour that you may find upon the many rotting or plague-ridden things within the material. So, as I stated before, Nurgle is a somewhat cheery and joyful entity, and so his demonic legions and mortal followers essentially follow suit, going about their business in spreading their master's poxes and diseases, watching as their master's pustulant work takes form with an almost unnerving amount of joy and glee. The followers of Nurgle, and of course the being himself, do not see the infections and plagues bestowed upon the many inhabitants of the galaxy as a blight. In fact, quite to the contrary, they believe them as a gift and interpret the afflicted scream of agony, not in fact as agony, but of gratitude for giving them the strength to overcome the obstacles of a regular mortal life. 
and because of this strange, almost paternal stance, his followers tend to refer to him as either Grandfather Nurgle, Father Nurgle, or the before mentioned Papa Nurgle. Now, being riddled with disease for all eternity, spreading plagues, isn't exactly an attractive thought. So what exactly is the allure of a life within the service of Nurgle? Well, to put it quite simply, life in the 41st millennium is cold, harsh, and unfeeling. Most Denzians of humanity live in an absolute miserable state of life, full of nothing but pain, hunger, and suffering, and service to the uncaring God Emperor that never answers the prayers uttered to him, making him essentially a strange, sinister, and essentially absent cosmic deity that's entirely pointless and bears absolutely no meaning. Ultimately, whether or not it is something we accept, all men live and eventually all men die. But those who choose to serve Nurgle, the question is usually for what do men die? What is the reason? For others to stand on their graves, throwing propaganda about the so-called God Emperor of mankind that was supposed to protect them? The divine being that was supposed to protect them in life and yet remain silent as they draw their last breath? victim to one of the countless horrors of the universe, where exactly is the reward in that, but to be forgotten in one of the many horrible, horrifying campaigns and to lose your life in service of this deity that, as we've said, is completely absent. Now, on the other hand, for those who choose to accept the fathomless gifts of the Grandfather, their reward is eternal hope. The inevitable deterioration of all things is ultimately unavoidable, and as I've heard it put before, bolters eventually begin to rust, the shells they fire are eventually spent, and the fingers that pull their triggers will one day wear down with the passing of time and repeated action. Over the course of their lives, mortal beings will without doubt sustain injuries, become infected with all manner of illnesses, sicken, and eventually succumb to either their wounds or unavoidably to the passing of time. And yet the aging that accompanies it will never stop. It is inevitably impossible to escape eventual deterioration. No matter how hard we try, it is ultimately inescapable, and yet human beings do absolutely nothing but try to escape this literally inevitable fear. Now, the ongoing attempt by mortal beings to delay decay and death motivates them to do things and reach heights of greatness they would have otherwise never achieved. It's essentially this that gives them the hope that if they can get through the dreary times of sorrow, that perhaps better times will eventually come in the future. The hope of possibilities in a universe where truly the only certain thing is billions face death constantly and horror will do nothing but breed and spread. Now within this grim darkness lies the father of plague just waiting for an opportunity to shine his light. For it is Nurgle that extends his pustulant hand, giving those weak mortals the strength that they need to effectively cast off the lies of the mankind's ecclesiarchy and all others who would sow false hope. It is the Plague Lord who invigorates and encourages those who choose to follow him to disobey the plight of mortal corruption and instead use it not as a weakness, but instead a source of both strength and inspiration. Now, all chaos gods bear something of a two-sided nature, yet Nurgle understands that his own dual natures, supposedly separate elements, actually work together in a harmonious and self-sustaining cycle, as opposed to being separate elements within two different explanations, essentially explaining the same thing. Now, to give an example here, I'll go back to what I said to begin with about all Chaos Gods bearing a two-sided nature, and state that, for example, Khorne, as I've heard it explained before, is on one side of the coin the god of bloodshed and battle, and upon the other, that of utter slaughter and bloody carnage. Whereas when you flip to the other side of that coin and look at the battle aspect, it embodies that of martial prowess and honour, and as such, a sense of accomplishment and personal betterment that comes with that. 
Now, that coin is essentially the same one coin, but in order to appreciate and understand both sides of it, you must essentially flip it and glare at both the blood and battle aspect individually. Now, as for Nurgle's coin, as by now I'm sure you've gathered, on one side there is of course the elements of disease, decay and inevitable death, but as we've already discussed, what is on the other side of Nurgle's coin is in fact just part and parcel of its previous side, that being resistance, hope, rebirth and growth. And what makes them part and parcel of the previous side is that all of these elements are essentially a direct byproduct of facing death and decay. Now, of course, this whole coin thing here is merely a metaphor in which our human minds can understand. But I find it important to mention that Nurgle concludes that there is absolutely no divide between these metaphorical faces at all. There is absolutely no beginning nor end. It is part and parcel of the same thing, the same coin, one face, not flippable. Now, a very important and interesting fact about Nurgle is how strangely harmonious both himself and his actions always seem to be, even seeming to be of an attentive and caring nature. To elaborate on what I mean here, to receive Nurgle's blessings, all someone really has to do is to have the desire to live and be willing to do absolutely anything it may take to cling to that life. Anything else within Nurgle's pantheon comes naturally from that point on. Whereas, for an example, those who devote themselves to the worship of, say, Zinch, must literally deny their lot in life and seek to change everything with a burning ambition, never, ever to at all appreciate what they have and always vying to have more or be better than what they are. Worshippers of Khorne, on the other hand, must forever push themselves towards enacting even bloodier and greater levels of killing, carnage and destruction, despite any immediate risk of harm to either themselves or allies. And followers of Slanesh attempt to escape the confines of reality in a haze of pleasurable sensation and utter self-delusion. Yet the only thing that a being requires to feel the loving touch of Grandfather Nurgle is to simply see life for what it is and to want to make the absolute most of it that they absolutely possibly can. All that is required is to have faith in the future that Nurgle can provide. Now, while an invitation to walk the postulant path of the Grandfather should of course be welcomed as an honour to those who follow him, as you can imagine, not all see it in this way, as of course deteriorating under the influence of a disease that causes your skin to peel and pus to ooze from your eyes and almost any other orifice is of course likely to be agonising to those afflicted and more often than not revolting to any others around them usually acting as some form of a repellent, adding the plight of loneliness to their ever-growing list of sorrows. Seeing the flesh around a loved one's wound turn black as it oozes blood and pus, the stench of its rotting tissue bringing tears to their eyes, is nothing but a simple reminder of the frailty of all mortals in which they all possess. So all Chaos Gods have rivalries between themselves, I want to take a minute to just talk about these. All other gods within the Immaterium usually fight amongst themselves, they play something called the Great Game, and I will definitely in future content discuss this, but as for now, we'll just talk about Nurgle and specific rivalries going on here, so... Usually, this rival extends further between specific gods within Chaos. Uh, like in, in Nurgle's case, this rivalry is between himself and, of course, the Lord of Change, Zinch. Now, in fact, Nurgle and the Lord of Change are age-old enemies, as the psychic energy that essentially allows them to exist comes from completely opposing emotions and beliefs. Zinch's power derives from hope and the ambition of mortals, 
giving them the ability to change their fortunes, while Nurgle's energy comes from the opposing factor of defiance, born out solely out of despair and hopelessness due to the inevitability of disease and the eventual death that follows it. Now, disciples of Nurgle are known to face off with the followers of Zinch in complex political intrigues in the mortal realm, always attempting to halt and otherwise disrupt his plans for change in almost any way that they possibly can. Now, all gods of chaos have their own respective realms within the Immaterium, a domain in which they rule over without question, and Nurgle's is simply known as the Garden of Nurgle. Now, the Garden of Nurgle is not just your average garden. In fact, maybe in reality, it's not truly even a garden at all. But the minds of those few mortal beings that attempt to essentially contemplate the manifestations of the Plague Lord must in some sense attempt to fathom what exactly it is that they have either seen for themselves or even just heard about in those whispered tales of Nurgle's realm in passing. In essence, they must be able to place it in some form of fathomable context that is relatable to them without essentially just losing their minds entirely to madness. The many forbidden texts and tomes that have attempted to illustrate the Fly Lord himself have more often than not agreed upon the idea of Nurgle's realm within the Immaterium being a vile and deadly, yet bizarrely beautiful garden, and so this description best puts this almost unexplainable realm of chaos into terms that they can fathom without effectively breaking their mind, causing them to lose their grip on sanity. Now, even though, as I stated before, the Garden of Nurgle is no average garden, it does share qualities with a regular garden. For example, the realm of the Plague God acts as a home to an absolutely baffling array of flora and fauna, all of which are connected and supported by the garden as a whole. Bells of bright blue shovel petal plants dig themselves out of their rooted positions, yet they leave the dirt in which they grew so that Nurgle's plague bearers can then plant a new crop of skull seeds in the rich soil. Now, as these freshly planted skull seeds grow and eventually bloom, they more often than not attract the attention of the large and playful beasts of Nurgle that tend to mistake their blossoming fruits for the head of new playthings. This, in turn, violently scatters and spreads their matter into the stenching air of the garden, where it inevitably comes to rest on the beating wings of the many ever-present flies that also call this domain home. Immediately slowed by the sticky mulch caused by the bespatter of the plants, these insects in turn become effortless quarry for the many other flying creatures of the realm that essentially swoop past and consume them with absolute ease, as they continue to glide through the noxious skies of the garden. Now, what these predators don't know is that these bloat flies are carriers of most, if not all, of Nurgle's horrific experimental diseases, not to mention all manner of his other many virulent creations. Now, with the bloat flies ingested, thus causing infections within the innards of these beasts, the predators become sickly and begin violently vomiting the foul contents of their stomach all over the garden, effectively spreading even more plague, pox and rot, as the fly around eventually coming to an explosive halt as they inevitably, well, explode, showering flesh and blood from the sky, fertilising yet more of the foul fauna and flora within the garden, as the before-mentioned flesh and blood decays and becomes essentially compost, thus beginning the entire process of life and death once more. Now, as I mentioned before, the Garden of Nurgle is not exactly a garden, as you would see it in the mortal realm of the Materium. But basically, the mortals who either hear the tales of it, or by some misfortune end up there themselves, have to try and make some sliver of sense from it. 
Now, with that being said, it does share certain similarities with that of a mortal garden, or even the many jungles that cover planet surfaces in real space. Though, again, just to clarify, it is by no means a regular worldly garden, or at least not in any sense that would make sense in regards to human sanity. In fact, if someone was to visit the bizarre and frankly terrifying place, they wouldn't just freely walk around, effectively taking in the sights, they experience exactly what needs to be experienced. In fact, you may assume that even the many demons of Nurgle that tend the garden are essentially some form of workforce that do their job and then leave to some other area, like a mortal job, but this is in fact not the case. The demons within Nurgle's garden are actually a large part of the experience itself, and are otherwise part of the garden in one way or another, accepting their place within the grandfather's plane and spending the rest of eternity enjoying all it has to offer them in regards to their own personal way of enjoying it. Now, the grandfather gifts all his children the ability to explore and appreciate his garden in almost a limitless number of ways, and even to become part of the garden itself, if that's something that they may be interested in. One thing that must be understood about the being Nurgle is yes, he may be a chaos god, but he also has a seemingly insatiable need for things to be in some form of order, and so he tends to constantly monitor the things that he creates and always maintains control over his various experiments. And so, going back to the case of someone visiting the garden, they would find it essentially an overwhelming thing to even observe, finding themselves surrounded by an absolutely bewildering amount of diverse experiences to explore, more likely to leave them dazed and confused than in a state of understanding. Now, in the centre of Nurgle's garden stands a large creaking mansion, its decaying structure groaning in the midst of the foul, rock-choked winds. Window frames bearing cracked and broken panes of glass covered in all manner of filth and grime adorn the sides of the manor, as the window's shutters scrape against the mansion's rotting walls, blowing back and forth in those said winds. Sewage drains constantly spit out all manner of disgusting creatures reminiscent of insects. Picture a centipede, except its body is a large, slimy tongue and its legs are replaced with rotting human fingers. Not a nice thing to picture. The pain on the mansion is in a constant state of cracking and regularly peels from the wooden wall beneath it. Yet regardless of this fact, the manor itself never seems to lose its greyish green hue. Strewn across the roof of the building are an absorbent amount of chimneys numbering in the hundreds. These chimneys constantly belch out large clouds of noxious smoke, filling the air with dark, smoggy clouds. And if you were to inspect the clouds more closely, you would see that they are in fact made up of millions of putrid disease-carrying flies, buzzing through the air, ready to start the before-mentioned process of life and death all over again. Strewn all over what we could call the grounds of this manor are trees made of bone that sprout fruit that rots even as it blooms, and upon the leafless branches of these ancient and disturbing trees hang demonic birds constantly singing the funeral dirges of any visitor that the mighty Plague Lord deems unwelcome to his realm. This manor is a house of disease, pestilence, decay and death, and is of course, if you haven't guessed, home to the Plague Lord Nurgle himself. Referred to as Nurgle's Mansion, or the Mansion of the Plague Lord, but for that reason, this towering mansion is also a place of hope and rebirth. There is absolutely no explanation as to how this manor still stands in its putrid, decaying state, but one would assume that the only possible reason is that it is the dwelling place of the Lord of All himself, whose continued passion, joy and boundless energy for his work finds the perfect harmony with that of decay, as he continues to, of course, go about his eternal purpose and work. 
The Plague Lord himself often sits in a huge rotting chair beside the front door of the mansion, often beseeching visitors to approach whether they've been called for or whether the Fly Lord had just noticed them in passing. Where Nurgle then shares many tales and questionable offerings, and an offer to explore the countless strange rooms within the mansion. Now, I just want to state that any guest entering the mansion of the Plague Father could easily become lost within the seemingly never ending corridors of the structure. Essentially, you're not just going to have a merry old chinwag with Nurgle in his living room and leave. In fact, a large majority of the time upon first entering the mansion, the decayed floorboards will give way and collapse, sending guests to their slow and inevitable death at the hands of the many carrion feeders which dwell on the lower levels of the manor, the guests being effectively consumed by the beasts over a long and likely painful period of time. Huge towering staircases decorated with ragged mothy and rugs call to wandering guests, inevitably leading them to one of the many chambers in which demons linger, only too glad to receive fresh flesh to consume or corrupt. Now it is possible that those souls wandering the halls of Nurgle's manor may sometimes bypass these rooms completely, though if they do, they are likely to find themselves in a place just as bizarre and dangerous, if not more so. Perhaps they will continue to ascend the stairs of the manor until they eventually stumble across the attic where the Plague Father keeps samples of his innumerable concoctions, all of which are catalogued and constantly counted by the demons that attend them. In and amongst the things in this attic lay rows of filthy jars containing the souls of the many plague-stricken mortals gathered throughout time and space. These glass jars are just apparently simple glass jars, and the souls within are left to relish in the agony of plague, until the inflictions eventually waste them to nothing but bone. Now on the other hand, if the guest of the mansion simply ignored the stairs and decided to continue deeper into the mansion, avoiding the before mentioned rooms, what they would find would be in no manner better. For Nurgle's home is essentially a testament to his will, with rotting, abhorrent horrors around every corner. For an example, if the guest did bypass the before mentioned rooms, they may in fact stumble into Nurgle's kitchen, which is no more pleasant than any of the previously mentioned rooms. In fact, within the kitchen of the mansion lays the larders of the grandfather, containing numerous shelves adorned with every foul ingredient and vile component of pestilence imaginable. Some that even utterly defy sanity, all of which are strangely neatly organised and labelled, ready to be poured into Nurgle's great cauldron, in which he mixes up and creates his various new maladies and concoctions. Now, anyone visiting Nurgle's home would be wise to quickly move on from the kitchen, alas they become an ingredient of Nurgle's concoctions themselves, as the before mentioned cauldron is one of the Plague Lord's most prized possessions, and in turn, he likes to keep it eternally full, brimming with new ingredients and flavouring for the ever cooking maladies within. In fact, it is within this great blackened cauldron that Nurgle brews all of his pestilent plagues he unleashes upon the mortal realm and its many Denzians. You must remember that the Plague Lord is an inquisitive and creative creature, and so he is constantly in a state of experimentation, always looking for new inspiration when it comes to brewing his various plagues and poxes, therefore the urge to add passing visitors to his current concoction in order to see the result is almost impossible for him to resist. Now, I find it important to mention that Nurgle is not like other Chaos Gods, as I mentioned before, and this extends to how he views his realm within the Immaterium. Now, the best way to explain this as before is to give you examples of how the other gods of Chaos view their own domains. So, for example, Khorne is known to very rarely even leave his seat atop his skull throne, essentially just barking orders at his various generals. 
Slanesh observes what's happening within his kingdom from within his aptly named Palace of Pleasure, or alternatively, he wanders around the universe attempting to lure mortals into giving up their souls in an attempt to satisfy his insatiable hunger. Zinch, on the other hand, doesn't really seem to care very much what state his strange, warped and fractured lands are in at all, instead spending the majority of his time plotting and interfering with affairs in realms far beyond his own. Now, Nurgle, on the other hand, absolutely cherishes his lands, and sees them as one of his masterworks. He adores all the beauty and surprise he perceives it to hold, and so regularly strolls its putrid pathways, stopping to consort with his many demons and observe the results as one of his many poxes takes effect upon the infected captive. The reality is, Nurgle is very much in touch with his vast lands and its many regions and those that dwell within them. Now, the Plague Lord loves to hear stories from places beyond his own realm. It's one of his biggest and most favoured forms of entertainment, and it inspires him to make new plagues and poxes that are in turn fit for the beings that inhabit them. And so one part of his garden that he seems to visit regularly is a place that he can attain such tales. This place being the deathbeds. Now, the deathbeds, like most of the other parts of the garden that Nurgle considers among his favourites, are in fact one of the first things thought up by the Plague Lord, and are likely among one of his designs to act as a model for the world yet to come, or as Nurgle dreams it yet to come. This area of the garden lays but a short stroll away from the mansion, and is perhaps the area of the garden he tends to visit most. Here, wayward travellers and invaders of the Plague Lord's lands are sucked deep into the festering soil, awaiting future use in either some foul concoction, or essentially just left to rot until their eventual demise. Now, the deathbeds serve a dual purpose as mentioned before. This ties into Nurgle's love of hearing stories from beyond the garden, for which he draws inspiration from. Creating all forms of new diseases to infect the places beyond the realm. Now, you might think, well, hold on, how does this place that he traps travellers and invaders in help him hear stories from beyond his realm exactly? Well, let me explain. Sometimes, when the Plague Lord comes across these entrenched beings within the deathbeds, it will offer them a chance to improve the position in which they currently find themselves by telling him stories of their worlds. Those few that manage to sufficiently amuse him are pulled from the putrid soil and taken to the mansion, where they will then soon be granted the mighty honour of becoming carriers of the before-mentioned plagues suited to their respective world, and once properly infected, the grandfather will give them one more horrific loving embrace before placing them back there to now spread the new plague to their world's populace. Now, it's worth mentioning briefly that there are parts of Nurgle's realms that aren't as permanent, let's say, as some of the others. Some of the areas of the garden come and go, fading in and out of existence with the passing of one of Nurgle's various plagues. On the other hand, some planes of the garden may simply exist only in the nightmarish visions and hallucinations of those minds ravaged by plague and disease, but in essence the garden of the Plague Lord is essentially nearing never-ending. Now, before I move on from the Garden of Nurgle, I am going to mention one more part of the garden that I personally find to be rather important, that being the Poxyards. And what the Poxyard are, in essence, are a testing ground of sorts. Think of them kind of like those nuclear testing sites that you see, with army generals stood in bunkers testing the efficiency of new bombs and various other weapons that have been, you know, newly deployed. Now, just as when you test a new weapon or device, each new disease that Nurgle concocts requires a different set of tests to essentially gather information pertaining to its ability to achieve the Flylord's desired effects. 
This means that the pox yard must be ever-changing to suit the needs of said tests, every time a new malady is concocted, and as such, the physical form of the pox yards shift constantly to suit the task it needs to carry out. An example of this might be that Nurgle may fill the pox yards with claw-thrust brambles and send unknowing captives infected with skinny in plagues bumbling into the demonic plants, hurrying their pace as they are chased by beasts of Nurgle, and if the captive plague carriers scream in agony as they pass through the razor-sharp edges upon the branches of the demon plants, then Nurgle becomes aware that the unfortunate wretches can still feel pain, and so off he goes back to the cauldron to refine the affliction. The Pockyards may also test the spirit of one of the many unfortunates within Nurgle's realm. Perhaps some poor wretch is thrown into its grasp, dehydrated and gasping for water, where they will find a beautiful crystal clear lake of water, but upon taking a gulp, the water will turn into pus in their mouths, trickling the yellowy ooze down their throat as they sink deeper into despair. No matter what the current incarnation of the Poxyard is, it's always providing new insights, and so this corner of the garden is of great importance to Nurgle, and is always a place he spends much of his time. Now I'll finish up this part of the video by stating there are many other places such as these within the garden of the Plague Lord, many virulent places that are constantly buzzing with pestilent activity and joy. There are many, many more places within Nurgle's realm he may visit to gather many of the ingredients for his work, converse with one of his many demons, or even just essentially observe the effects of his numerous works. But for now, I think I've given a basic overview of the land of the Plague Lord and what you may find there, and so I shall move on from this section with the promise of taking a deeper delve into this subject sometime in the future. Now, as we are talking about Nurgle, it seems only right to mention some of the demons within his service, though I will only mention each briefly, as we plan to release a video discussing the many demons of chaos in much more rigorous detail. But don't worry, it is on the card, so to speak. So, as we all know, chaos gods have their own respective demons that serve under them usually in the form of greater demons, the more powerful of their respective god's demon underlings, essentially the living embodiment of their respective god in both form and will. Then we of course have the lesser demons, essentially the entities of the warp that are most prevalent, that make up the various legions and servants of their respective chaos god, and are usually countless in number and endlessly diverse. These are essentially the soldiers and warriors, beasts and messengers, tallymen and scribes of their chaos masters, and these unending masses of demons exist solely to serve and carry out their specific creator's will. So the first demon on our list is the lesser demon of Nurgle, that is the most common, I would say, simply known as a Nurgle. Nurglings are minuscule demons who love nothing more than to cause as much mischief as possible. Nurglings are in essence tiny carbon copies of the Plague Lord himself, and in my opinion, if you were to see one, you'd probably describe it as something accustomed to an imp. These tiny demons tend to swarm together in large numbers, and when they fight alongside Nurgle's forces, they tend to attack enemies in huge floods, a massive crowd of them pouring across enemies almost akin to a tidal wave, chewing and clawing as they go, feeding on the fat and the muscle of their screaming enemies, giggling away to themselves as they enact this horror. Now, upon occasion, Chaos Champions that have proven themselves dedicated to Nurgle and his holy mission will become infested with Nurglings, which will live in the many gaping wounds upon the Champion's body. And when the Champion gets into combat, these vicious little demons will help to defend the Champion, though it's more of a case of them defending what they consider to be their home. It's also said that those Chaos Lords and Champions chosen by Nurgle will bear a Nurgling that almost acts as a herald of the Plague God, marking out the Lord as one of Nurgle's chosen. To that end, I will read a quick quote from a fragment of the Liber Pestilentia. And the Great Father marks out those who are chosen 
with the gifts of his Nurglings. These servants bear on their multitudinous backs his champions and chosen. They will war for them and nurture them and aid them in spreading the gifts of Father Nurgle to the undeserving and unappreciated Imperium of Man. And with that we come to the next lesser demons of Nurgle, aptly named Plague Bearers. Plague bearers are vile, pestilent, rotting creatures and tend to be the size of an average humanoid. They also bear a similarly humanoid appearance, though usually with a single festering eye and horns extruding from their sickly, fleshy heads. Or at times, they even have the head of a fly, which I think is pretty cool. These disgusting demons form the average rank and file within the many demon legions of the Plague Lord, and they stumble around armed usually with a plague sword or bile blade, flies constantly buzzing around their heads, effectively distracting those who engage them in combat, making them much more difficult to fight. The plague bearers of Nurgle, hence their name, are known to carry many virulent diseases into battle with them. In fact, the forces of Nurgle know all too well and tend to use it to a terrible effect. It is said that these foul demons are crafted from the blighted souls of those affected by the virulent disease known simply as Nurgle's Rot. Now, another lesser demon of Nurgle, and perhaps one of my absolute favourites, is the Plague Toad. Plague Toads are, as you can imagine, essentially what their name describes. Monstrously disgusting, deformed and mutated pseudo-amphibian bags of pus, of which are more than capable of opening their gaping mouths wide, effectively swallowing a human being whole. As you can imagine, as it is with most creatures of the Plague Lord, Plague Toads usually find themselves drawn to places which are mired in the stench of plague and decay, and it has been known that in these disease-ridden places, sorcerers familiar with the law of the Grandfather can essentially summon these demonic creatures, and upon successfully summoning them, they can bind them in service, where these beings remain bound to that sorcerer's will. And so we get to another form of the before mentioned plague bearers, titled Plague Drones. Though I will say that Plague Drone is more of a title and Plague Drones are essentially still Plague Bearer demons. The difference being that Plague Drones are essentially Plague Bearers of higher ranking and usually hold a leadership position within one of the many demonic legions of Nurgle. A title that conveys a commendable amount of pride within said legion and Nurgle's forces as a whole. These demons act as somewhat of an overseer of Nurgle's emergence into the Materium, saddled atop huge rock flies. The Plague Drone's aerial mounted position also allows them to constantly and correctly tally the Plague Lord's many poxes and plagues, abundantly sweeping the field of battle they saw above, while also granting them the ability to quickly intercede should the forces of the Plague Lord or their divine mission meet with any form of opposition. Now, with the mention of Plague Drones comes another lesser demon, that of course being the previously mentioned Rot Flies that carry them into battle. Now, rot flies are no average fly, and definitely not a fly of regular proportion. In fact, to the contrary, rot flies are absolutely mountainous demonic insects, said to be that hideous in form that to even look upon them can literally scar a mortal's mind. These repulsive beasts are stated to be among the most abhorrent of all the Lord of Decay's vile creations, and only the forbidden tomes located within the Black Library of the Aldari race utter knowledge of the process in which these monstrosities are given life, as they are said to hatch within the previously mentioned Garden of Nurgle within the Realm of Chaos. Now, earlier in the video, you may have heard me mention Beasts of Nurgle, and these creatures are yet another lesser demon of Nurgle, and they are genuinely one of my favourites. 
Now, beasts of Nurgle are sincerely horrifying demonic aberrations. Imagine the body of a fattened, slimy slug bearing webbed feet, a face made up of wriggling tentacles, and a large, lashing, tail-like growth that essentially bursts from its putrid, sticky back in a state of constant wagging back and forth or side to side. It's been stated that these disgusting creatures tend to act in a fashion somewhat similar to that of what only can be explained as an inquisitive pet. Beasts of Nurgle are the physical embodiment of Nurgle's excitement and never-ending enthusiasm for life and death, and so they enjoy nothing more than discovering something new. Beasts of Nurgle are in fact strange creatures within the rank of Chaos Demons, and to its strange and simple mind, it genuinely wishes to make new friends. To that end, unlike most other demons, Beasts of Nurgle do not kill maliciously with sharp claws and mouths full of teeth, but instead with an utterly bizarre form of kindness. That's right, kindness. Unfortunate victims are picked up, embraced and fondled, while being coddled and stroked by the creature's slimy tentacles, while simultaneously being licked by its long, slobbering tongue. As you can imagine, soon after this occurs, the victim almost immediately falls ill, infected by all manners of rot and disease, before promptly liquefying eventually being crushed under the hulking creature, being effectively ground into nothing more than mulch. The beast will then begin to feel a sense of fleeting sadness for its now deceased new friend, and their inability to join the exuberant fun. But as I stated, this feeling is fleeting and quickly passes the beast. It then turns back to the next thing that draws its attention and of course focuses on that. Now, as before, the demon I'm about to mention is again more of a title than an entirely different form of demon, those being Heralds of Nurgle. Now, Heralds of Nurgle are essentially elite plague bearers. Now, I'll just state that in the realm of Nurgle, it is an absolute honour to be one of those demons to serve within the legions of the Plague God. But, as in all armies, there is of course the rank and file, and there are those destined for more. Those that show merit and prove themselves to be a cut above the rest, usually by the exceptional deeds that they perform. And this is also something that exists within the demon legions of the Plague Lord. If a plague bearer shows his worth, usually in terms of their power and capacity to bear the grandfather's most virulent plagues, then they are rewarded with Nurgle's further blessings, and so they are raised to become his heralds, performing either the most vital duties required of them within the Plague Lord's realm of the Garden, or leading Talibans of demons beneath them within a demon legion. Now, this next one I will not go into much detail with, as I plan to have a somewhat deeper delve into them later, as is the plan concerning all Demons of Chaos. But as a basic overview, these demons are simply known as Vile Servants. So, in essence, Vile Servants are horrifying demonic manifestations of the various plagues and poxes that have claimed numerous mortal lives usually draped in the putrid remains of the flesh that victims of these foul diseases once wore. Vile servants are essentially avatars of disease, destruction and death, and usually appear in the shape of an eerie figure adorned in sealed containment suits, thick in grime, seeping with moisture akin to sweat upon the brow of the sickly. Inside the suit, it gets far worse, it being essentially filled to the brim with nothing but decomposing liquefied flesh, teeming with wriggling insects and all manner of other vermin, all held together by nothing but the filthy, drooping suit. These creatures exist solely to infect worlds with nothing but suffering, eventually dragging them into nothing but putrid ruin. And so, we come to the last type of lesser demon that I'm going to mention in today's video, Plague Swarms. 
Now, plague swarms are pretty self-explanatory, as you can imagine. A plague swarm is a force of utterly mindless destruction, which resembles that of, you guessed it, an insect swarm. Except these swarms being creations of Nurgle, they are essentially creatures of utterly horrifying form and teeming with various manners of rot and decay. Just as the many insect swarms of the Materium, these hordes of demonic insect-like beings move in unison, forming one implacable horrifying mass. To get caught up in one of these swarms would be utterly terrifying, yet not for long as they tend to pass through the victims, stripping flesh from bone as they go, infecting and annihilating everything they come into contact with. Now, the subject of demons within chaos is a subject in and amongst itself, and I feel it hugely necessary to give at least a basic overview on them while discussing their specific chaos god. Yet, it is easy to become sidetracked and go off on a tangent regarding related content while discussing a subject. And while I want to give you guys a full picture and explanation of who or what Nurgle is, and though the various demons within his service are an integral part of that, I don't want to get too sidetracked here and end up making this into a video all about Chaos Demons, and so we'll briefly discuss Greater Demons and then move forward. Okay, so first of all, what is a greater demon? Well, as I explained earlier, a greater demon is essentially the most powerful form of demon within the service of their respective god, usually being the physical embodiment of said god, taking their image and being both the guardians of their realm and of course the harbingers of their will. In the Materium, greater demons tend to manifest as gigantic, terrifying monstrosities with the ability to cause an untold amount of damage to mortal beings, both physically and mentally, exterminating hordes of soldiers, heavy armoured units, and causing untold terror upon those who lay their eyes upon them, causing minds to break with their mere presence. They also tend to have strange warp-born powers drawn from the psychic energy of the Immaterium and are almost impervious to most forms of mortal weaponry. Amongst the greatest of the demons that serve Nurgle stands the Great Unclean Ones. The horror imposed upon a mortal being at just the mere sight of this creature cannot be understated, and to the eyes of a mortal being, a great unclean one is without doubt the most horrific of all of the servants of chaos. Great unclean ones are without question the harbingers of the Fly Lord, and as such they are counted among Nurgle's greatest servants altogether. These horrifying greater demons are the ones who bear the most sacred plagues and poxes concocted by the Plague Father, which is yet another statement regarding their importance. As I stated before, these are truly hideous and horrendous creatures to gaze upon, mountainous and corpulent, covered in festering boils and decomposing flesh, gaping sores weep, and huge tender boils burst all over the creature, spattering thick yellow pus everywhere within its vicinity. Strands of thick, sloppy, cord-like intestines spill out of enormous tears in its rotund and bulging belly, and two impossibly tiny legs seemingly supporting the virulent creature and its hulking girth. Finally, huge antlers reminiscent of a stag adorn the demon's bulbous head. Each of these great unclean ones have been shaped by Nurgle himself to essentially mirror him, and therefore we can surmise that to gaze upon the horror of a great unclean one would be reminiscent of gazing upon the Plague Father himself. Now, though the Great Unclean Ones are considered to be the greatest of Nurgle's greater demons, there are also the Demon Princes, essentially former mortal beings, usually some chaos-worshipping human, or more often than not, one of the many heretic Astartes whose devotion and accomplishments within their god's service has been that extensive that the particular god has seen it fit to transform them into an immortal Demon Prince. 
demon princes of Nurgle specifically are huge lumbering monstrosities with an absolutely unnatural level of resilience, rendering them almost invulnerable to most forms of attack. The most known of these demon princes is of course Mortarion, the Primarch of the Death Guard Astartes Legion which turned traitor in the galaxy spanning war known as the Horus Heresy, eventually leading to the Legion being in the service of the Plague Lord. And if you want to know more about that, we do have a video discussing the basics of the Death Guard Legion, and we will leave a link for that at the end of this video. So, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to leave you with a personal summary about the Lord of Plagues. Now, Nurgle is of course to anyone looking at him with human eyes and at a base level an absolutely horrific entity feeding off the despair and hopelessness of those inflicted with whatever maladies eventually, inevitably cause them to suffer and decay and die. But he is of course the entity that seems to preside over most, if not all, physical corruption in the universe, and of course where he finds joy, those of us with a human outlook on life find nothing but morbidity, suffering and horror. And to be touched by one of Nurgle's numerous gifts would be less than desirable to say the very least. Yet on the other side of this, I genuinely don't believe that Nurgle is a malicious creature with the intent to cause nothing but harm, as it is with some of his fellow Chaos Enters. As mentioned earlier in the video, the inevitable entropic decline of all things is a mere part of the cycle of life, death, and eventually rebirth. And so in many ways I believe that Nurgle and those who choose to follow him believe they are essentially easing the passing of this natural state of things. Nurgle offers a choice to his chosen followers, essentially a chance to free themselves from the eternal despair caused by the mortal dread of infection, suffering and inevitably death, and if I'm honest that doesn't sound to me like a being out to effectively just purposely cause anguish with no real reason, except that of to literally be malicious. Now I will say before I end my brief personal summary here, that the warp is essentially an absolute enigma, and to try to understand it from a mortal perspective is usually going to bear very little to absolutely no fruit. But from the glimpses that we can almost fathom, I think that we can start to piece together some of our own opinions and information based on what we ourselves know, and that is all I've attempted to do here with this summary. As always, some people may have a difference in opinion, some people may see something entirely different to what I'm seeing, and some people may agree wholeheartedly, but this, in my opinion, again, in my opinion, is the beauty of 40k, and as I've always said, we love anything on this channel that breeds discussion, so if you guys have an opinion on the chaos god known as Nurgle, please don't hesitate to leave it in the comments below. Now we get into that part of the video where I usually leave you guys with a quote, and rest assured I will still do so. But before I do, I just want to reiterate that this video is intended to be a basic summary of the Chaos God Nurgle, and we plan to cover more surrounding him and his worship in future content. One I find particularly interesting is the story of how Nurgle came to hold the Eldari maiden goddess Isha captive, and rest assured, some future content will detail what exactly happened there. So if that's something that you'd be interested in hearing, be sure to hit subscribe and hit that notification bell to stay up to date with all our ever-growing content. So as for today's quote, I decided to simply give you a chant sung by plague bearers as they march across the many plague choked battlefields they find themselves upon, and I think it truly sums up at the very least what fate awaits you should you embrace or even face off with the forces of Nurgle. Bubo's phlegm, blood and guts, boils, bogies, rot and pus, blisters, fevers, weeping sores, from your wounds the fester pours. 
So, in today's video, we have briefly discussed the play God Nurgle. As always, and as mentioned in the video, we aim to bring more content your way that focuses on the many stories and factions surrounding not just Nurgle, but all the Chaos Gods. We hope you've enjoyed today's video, and if you have, as always, hit that thumbs up button. Knowing that you guys are enjoying our videos is the reason that we do this, and we really appreciate your continued support. If you're new to the channel or not subscribed, be sure to hit that subscribe button in the corner and make sure that that notification bell is on so you continue to stay up to date with all our future content and endeavours. And with that, I have been your gracious host, Adeptus Artorum, and I thank you for watching.